Chair, I am with Adlib, who are PhD students at Sorbonne University. Today, we will be presenting a work with Jean-Philippe Vert from Google and Gérard Arbiot from Sorbonne University. The goal of our work is to derive theoretical guarantees for recurrent neural networks. As a reminder, a recurrent neural network, or RNN, is defined by a sequence of hidden states H1 to HT. At each time step J, we compute the new hidden state Hj plus 1 as a function of the previous hidden state Hj and of the new data point Xj plus 1. Then, the output of the network, m theta of x, is a linear projection of the last hidden state. There are several possibilities for the update function f theta, the simplest one being the feedforward RNN, where f theta simply consists in a single hidden layer. Here, we have to take a smooth activation function, as we need higher order der derivatives to be well defined in the following. As you are probably aware, doing maths on deep neural networks is a difficult task. However, there is a promising recent direction coming from the paradigm of neural ordinary differential equations. Essentially, the idea is to replace a discrete layer equation by a continuous one. Historically, it came in two steps. First, introduce the residual equation by adding the Hj term, which was pro proposed in a very well-known paper by E. et al. in 2015. Then, remark that the residual network can be viewed as an Euler discretization of a differential equation. In their 2018 paper, Chen et al. proposed to actually train this continuous network, which can be done by replacing the back propagation by the, by the so-called adjoint method. This idea re really picked up speed with lots of proposed algorithms and architectures. Here, as you will see, our point of view is a little bit different. We really see the continuous network as an intermediate tool to enable the mathematical study of the standard RNN. So, coming back to the RNN, we have now two models, a discrete one and a continuous one. Note that the discrete RNN is formulated in a residual manner and with an additional one over t factor. As t goes to infinity, this model converges toward the continuous model. It is quite easy to show that both models are equivalent up to some constant over t using standard Euler estimates. As a remark, note that here and in the following, we use lowercase notations for discrete variables and uppercase notations for continuous variables. This point of view comes with corresponding assumptions on the data. More precisely, we consider that our data points x1 to xt are a discretization of a continuous path x. In this setting, the difficulty of the problem is not linked to t, as it is usually the case for recurrent networks, but it is linked to the smoothness of x, which can be measured, for instance, with its total variation. As a consequence, we make the regularity assumption that the norm of x in total variation is bounded by some constant l lesser than 1. As a caveat, this setting may not be reasonable for all data types. For instance, it does not adapt very well, well sorry, it does not adapt very well to textual data. We can now state our main results. We show the existence of a Hilbert space T and of two mappings S and alpha, such, such that the output of the discrete RNN is approximately equal to a scalar product in T between alpha of theta and S of X. The one over T approximation is simply the Euler error I was mentioning just before. The crucial idea here is that we are able to express the RNN as a scalar product where we separate the data representation S of X 
from the RNN parameters alpha of phi. In other words, we found a feature map for our data, S of X, which is called the signature, such that the action of the RNN is linear on those features. This is exactly the setting of a kernel method. Hence, we can reformulate the result as the existence of a reproducing kernel Hilbert space, which contains the error up to the 1 over t error term. Here, I'd like to refer you to a work by Bietti and Meral with a similar ID, but for convolutional neural networks. As a, as a consequence of this main result, we are able to derive gen generalization and stability bounds. The idea of generalization is to upper bound the gap between train error and test error. But we won't talk about this now, and we refer to our paper for details. As for stability, the goal is to ensure robustness to noise and adversarial attacks. Let's give a few details on this bound, which is easier to derive. Take two inputs, x and x prime. The goal is to ensure that the corresponding outputs are closed if the inputs are closed. With our result, a straightforward calculation using the bilinearity of the scalar product and the cauchy schwarz inequality yields the bound you can see on the screen. As you can see, the crucial quantity is to control the bound is the norm of alpha of theta in the Hilbert space T. This result suggests to use this quantity as a regularizer at training time, which is a similar ID to kernel ridge regression. We will come back to that later. Now, we would like to give you an overview of the main ideas of the proof. As we saw earlier, the first step is to bound the difference between the discrete RNN and its continuous counterpart. Then, we use an algebraic trick to reformulate the ODE as a controlled differential equation, or CDE. This is where the signature S of X comes into play. It allows to frame the solution of the CDE as a scalar product in an infinite dimensional tensor space. Now, I will let Adeline walk you through number, steps number two and three. The goal of rewriting the ODE as a CDE is to remove the dependency on the data from the function f. It can be done with simple linear algebra tools at the cost of increasing the dimension of a problem. So the solution of a CD is a new hidden state of higher dimension denoted by h bar. Then x bar is just a simple modification of x, and the bold f function is a map taking as input so h bar, the new hidden state, and outputting a matrix of the correct dimensions. The right-hand side of the CD is therefore a matrix vector multiplication. f of h bar is a matrix, which we multiply by the vector dx bar. To set these ideas on an example, let's look at the case of a feedforward RNN. A possible choice for a function bold f is then the block matrix with diagonal 0, identity matrix in the bottom left block, and a slight modification of the layer equation in the top right block. Then it is straightforward to show that this CD has a unique solution, h bar, and that the projection of h bar and its first coordinates is equal to the solution of the fit word OD. The last coordinates of h bar are simply equal to x. Now, the next step is to apply tools from the theory of CDEs to make a scalar product appear. Let h be the solution of CD, and fi denote the columns of the matrix f, bold. h can then be written in the form of a Taylor expansion. Recall that the Taylor expansion of a real-valued function g is an infinite sum of monomials, x minus a to the k, multiplied by higher order derivatives of g. If we compare our Taylor expansion to the classical one, we see that the derivatives are replaced by the term in red, consisting of higher order derivatives of the layer functions, and the powers of x are replaced by the term in orange, s i1 i k of x, called the signature of x. 
we will give a few words on that later. So we need to ensure the convergence of this infinite sum. This is highly non-trivial, and we show it in the paper for feedforward RNN with logistic or hyperbolic tangent activation under a condition on the norm of the weight matrices. This condition might seem restrictive, but in practice, we verify empirically the convergence even when it is not met. More precisely, we have implemented this Taylor expansion in PyTorch by truncating the infinite sum at an order n. So here, the x-axis is this order of truncation n, and the y-axis is the error between the true solution h and its Taylor approximation. We can see that the approximation is the convergence is exponential in n, and the low error is rich even for really small values of n. Let us now give a few details on the signature transform that we mentioned earlier. The signature is a tool coming from stochastic analysis, which is more, more and more used in machine learning to create feature sets for time series. Indeed, it maps a multivariate time series of any length to a sequence of coefficients without losing too much information. It is worth mentioning that it is a transformation invariant by translation and reparameterization, which is often a desirable property. Combined with deep learning algorithms, it has achieved state-of-the-art performance on several applications, such as Chinese character recognition or early detection of sepsis in the FusionNet challenge. More precisely, signatures are infinite sequences of tensors of increasing orders. If we denote by RD tensor k the tensor space of order k, then the signature of order k is an element of this space defined as iterated integrals of x. The precise meaning of this obscure formula is not needed here. We refer the interested participant to a textbook on the matter. We then introduce the space t of infinite sequences of tensors of increasing order, which are square summable. Endowed with a right scalar product, this is an infinite dimensional Hilbert space. This is exactly the Hilbert space that was mentioned in our main results and where the data is embedded via the signature. Note that classical properties of the signature ensure that they are square summable under assumptions and are therefore elements of T. Putting everything together, we obtain the output of the network by simply multiplying the Taylor expansion by a matrix W, which gives exactly a scalar product in T. We stress again that this is equivalent to saying that the RNN belongs to the RKHS associated to the signature kernel um, on the screen. The result was fully proved for feedforward RNN, but the methodology is really general and could be applied to other architectures such as LSM or GRE. The missing step is to bound the norm of the terms in red in the equation, which depend only on the architecture. This step is very technical which is why we focused on feedforward RNN. Going back to practical matters, we call that this result suggests the following regularization by the RKHS norm. We have applied this regularization a toy task consisting of classifying two-dimensional spirals. We compare the adversarial accuracy of the RNN trained with and without the regularization. We observe that the accuracy is higher in the regularized case. We stress that this is only an illustration that our approach is reasonable, but much, more, much work remains to be done to leverage this theory to applications. To conclude, we have framed RNN as a kernel method in the continuous time limits. The key idea is to obtain this result of a neural ODE paradigm and the signature kernel. As a consequence, we obtain generalization and stability bounds. We refer to our paper for the generalization bounds obtained and for all the technical details. There is still a lot of remaining work to leverage this theory to practical application, and we would be excited to hear suggestions from the community on this. The next step we are currently working on is to adapt the approach to other architectures such as ResNet. You can find uh, all the references in the slides. And uh, we thank you very much, uh, you, for listening to until the end of the talk. We'd be happy to answer your questions during Q&A, at the poster, poster session, or by email. Thank you, and bye.